We have been engaged in this series, and we're continuing our series in the Disciple Shift, where we talk about the eight habits of highly effective disciples. And what we've been talking about are habits that we can form, things that we can do that will not only lead us closer to Jesus, but will help us to be like Jesus so that we can empower others to do the same. And we've been talking about habits such as devotion and prayer and rest. The last time I was with you, we talked about community and the importance of God's people coming and worshiping together, especially as we get closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to be talking about habit number five, and it's healing. And when I say healing, what I'm talking about is that, well, I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes things in life, they become broken. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that we come into this world with a brokenness and God can heal it. And today I want to talk about how it is that people who are fully devoted followers of Jesus, people who are disciples, they understand and they know that when something is broken, the first place you go is to Jesus. And I want to talk about that today. Back in the 1990s, when I was working in community mental health, you might remember that I also have a background in behavioral science. And uh, back in the 90s, I was involved in community mental health, addictions recovery, and I was also working in Aboriginal child welfare. And back then, we had a catchphrase that was going through the health community, um, the caregiving uh, services, whether it was mental health, uh, uh, psychology, or even medical um, healing. There was this catchphrase. It was called holistic healing. In other words, we recognize that human beings aren't just one-dimensional creatures, but that there actually are several dimensions to every single person, mind, body, soul, and your relationships. And these dimensions, these aspects of a person's life come together to form and create a whole person, a healthy person. Now, that was back in the 90s. We had four things, mind, body, soul, relationships. Today, we have expanded uh, our understanding of human beings. And now today, we have and we understand that there are eight dimensions, eight aspects to a human being's life that come together to contribute to your health, and your happiness, and when they are working together in harmony, and you have wholeness and healing, they actually produce, well, happiness and joy and peace. Well, take a look at this. We are emotional beings. We have occupations. Uh, there's the intellectual, the environmental. There's the financial aspect, the social, the physical, and the spiritual. All eight of these dimensions are so interconnected that when you affect one, you affect the others. For example, I want you to imagine um, you lost your job. If you lost your job, would you be experiencing anything psychologically and emotionally? Right? You might be angry or you might be depressed. And, and that mood change might change the way you behave. You might not be sleeping, you might not be eating. I mean, depending on the job that you lost, maybe you're rejoicing because you're gonna get a better job. I don't know, but it will affect your mood. Your mood will affect your behavior. Your behaviors are gonna affect relationships. Your mood and behavior and relationships are going to affect you spiritually. Do you understand you are not just a one-dimensional creature but you have aspects and dimensions to your life whereby when they are healthy and they work together, you are a healthier, happier, <laughs> happier, more hope-filled, more whole human being. Now, here's where I'm going with this. Do you think that our Creator knows this about us? Do you think that our Creator knows that we are not just a one-dimensional being, but that we have actual aspects to our life that are interconnected? Do you think that God knows this? Yes. Do you think that God knows that if you impact any one of these, you will also impact your spiritual state of being? Do you, do you understand this? This is all so interconnected that when you bring down one, you can bring them all down, and when you bring one up, you can bring them all up. Do you think God knows this? 
Do you think your heavenly Father, knowing this about you, is invested in you being and having the healthiest life that you can have? Did Jesus not say, I've come to give you life, but he said, I come to give you life more abundantly. And fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ understand that God is invested in every aspect and dimension of your life, which is why we have so much counsel in the Word of God. Do you know that the Word of God actually speaks to every single one of these dimensions and more? Why do you think God gives so much counsel and direction and even commandments in each of these areas of your life? Because God is love. Your heavenly Father loves you, and as such, he is invested in you experiencing the best life possible, and I know that sounds a little prosperity gospel, doesn't it? But do you understand that as a parent, I am invested in my kids having the best life possible? I am invested in every single one of these areas of my kid's life, my wife's life, and as a disciple, I understand that God is invested in these aspects of my life, and he wants you to be invested in your life as well. Because your life is a gift from your heavenly Father, and he wants you to live it to the full. And so... As fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, we are always asking God to search me, O Lord, and if you find something broken within me, let's pray that God will write it. God is not only interested in healing your brokenness, but he wants you to have a life that is emotionally and spiritually, relationally, beyond anything you could think or imagine. In other words, God wants you to be happy. And I know there are some people who say, no, no, don't focus. No, God does want you to be happy. He wants you to be healthy, and he wants you to have healthy, happy relationships. God wants you to experience joy, happiness, love, and fulfillment. And as such, he's invested in every aspect of your life. And it's all in the word of God. So today we're going to be talking about a man, and he was broken. This man went to his doctor, because he had this spot, right? You know how sometimes you say, hey, I know it like the back of my hand? One day he's looking at the back of his hand, and he's going, where'd that come from? And it was a spot, and it was a white spot, and the news was not good. Now, you can read about his story in 2 Kings chapter 5. Please, take your Bibles. We're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 5 today. We're going to be starting out in verse 1, and you know the story. It's a very famous story, and we often tell it or read it as a children's story. It's 2 Kings chapter 5. It's verse 1, and it is the story of Naaman and Elisha. And here's what we read. The king of Aram had great admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Back in the day, if you were given a diagnosis of leprosy, you were basically handed a death sentence. When when Naaman was told by his physician that he had leprosy, do you think that he was experiencing something emotionally and psychologically on the inside of him? I would. If, If the doctor told me I had something that was terminal and I didn't have long to live, that would upset me. That would affect me. I would be feeling things emotionally and psychologically. But not only that, but back in the day, it not only took your life, but it took your entire life. Because Naaman was about to lose everything he had ever loved and anyone he had ever loved. Because when you had leprosy, well, we have a term today. They treated me like a leper. Ever ever hear this saying? Uh, I got treated like a leper or they're treating somebody like a leper. Do you know what that saying means? 
It means we refuse to engage with them. We refuse to have a relationship with them. Today we call it ghosting. In the 90s, we called it treating somebody like a leper. In other words, they were a social outcast. His life was over. He would no longer be a general. He would no longer be a soldier. He would no longer be a man of honor. He would no longer be a mighty man of valor and war. He would no longer be a husband. He would no longer be a father. He would no longer be a friend. His life as he knew it had died before he did. He was broken. So we read in verse 2. At this time, Armenian raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of his leprosy. I read this, and I'm thinking, right now, Naaman has got only one thought on his mind. There is only one thought right now, and it is the most important thought going through his mind, and it's this, where can I find this guy? Right? If you were diagnosed with terminal cancer, and somebody said there's a doctor out there with a cure, you would be saying, where can I find this guy? You'd be going to Google. You'd be going to Twitter. You'd be going to Instagram. You would be, you would be shaking down the social media and the internet trying to find this guy. Who is he? Where can I find him? And we do that. I remember when I received the call to come to Nepean to be your pastor. And, and I had some people tell me that as soon as the news got out that Pastor Bob Windsor was coming to Nepean, there were a number of people, guess what they did? They looked me up on YouTube. You want to know, how can we find this guy? What's he about? What's he like? Uh, oh, what are we getting into here? Right? And by the way, I did the same. I went online. I YouTubed you because I wanted to know where you were. What was I getting into? Naaman doesn't care what he's getting into. He just wants to know, where can I find this guy? Because he's looking for wholeness to his brokenness. And so he goes to his king and he's asking his king for support. And his king says, go and visit the prophet. The king of Aram told him, I will send a letter of introduction for you to take to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out carrying as gifts 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. An American translated this, not a Canadian. But understand, this is a gift fit for a king. There's over 4 million, by today's standards, there's over $4 million in gold here. There's more than $300,000 in silver, and I don't know about the clothing, but back in the day, clothing could be expensive. It can be expensive today, too. I know, I've heard about $2,000 no, $2, for shoes, ladies. $5,000 for a purse. And guys, two dollars to $5,000 for an Armani suit. Back in the day, rich clothing was money. This is a gift fit for a king, but the king of Israel, he's throwing a fit. He is not happy about this, and let me show you why. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes in dismay, and he said, am I God? that I can give life and take it away? Why is this man asking me to heal someone with leprosy? I can see that he's just trying to pick a fight with me. Aram has asked the king of Israel to do the impossible. And yet you and I, we live in a world where the world in which we live claims to be able to heal brokenness on a level it is actually not capable of doing. We live in a broken world. As a matter of fact, folks, let's be honest. The reason so many of us 
have given our lives to Jesus is because Jesus healed our brokenness in a way the world cannot. There are things the world simply cannot fix. There are things governments cannot cure. And and I believe in good democratic government. I do believe that government and laws and order are important, but there are things that politics cannot heal. I also believe in psychology and the medical professions. I do believe in them. I'm a part of that. I was a part of that community for 25 years. I believe in it, but I can tell you that as somebody who practiced community mental health, I came to understand there are things that psychology cannot heal. What you need is a miracle. And what I've discovered is that there are three ways in which God does heal people. He can work through the natural. Some of you, you're really good at home remedies. Uh, Some good lemon and some good garlic and maybe a tobacco leaf. You're not smoking it, you're drinking it. But some of you, you're really into home remedies, and they work. Sometimes we have to go to the medical profession, and by the way, God does work through doctors and nurses, which is why the Seventh-day Adventist Church has one of the largest hospital and medical systems in the world. We believe that God works through medical intervention, but there are times when what you need is a miracle. And church... When you're a fully devoted follower of Jesus, you understand that when the first thing you do, one of the first things you do is that when it's broken, you take it to Jesus. There are things this world cannot fix. One of them, for example, is guilt and shame. I cannot tell you how often we had people who were depressed, they were anxious, they were lonely, and they were addicted And what they were trying to do was medicate their guilt and their shame. I cannot tell you how many alcoholics I had encountered because these were people who had done something, they knew it was wrong, they knew it hurt other people, and they didn't know how to get past the guilt or the shame, so they tried to smoke it away, drink it away, eat it away, or sleep it away. All of us are born broken. Bible says that when we come into this world, we come into this world with a sinful fallen nature. We are born spiritually dead, and when you're spiritually dead, that spiritual death, that what the Bible calls iniquity, we come into the world corrupted, twisted, and mutated, and in our corruption, we use our free will to not only hurt us and our Heavenly Father, but we use that free will to hurt other people. We sin, and we experience guilt, and we experience shame. The government cannot create a law to take away your guilt and shame. Psychologists today will tell you that, well, guilt is useless. Just ignore your guilt, or they will try to find some way to excuse away your behavior so you're not responsible for that bad thing you've done. The problem is, you know you did it, you know it was wrong, and you still feel the guilt. Every single human being on this planet, in some way, shape, or form, we are broken, and yet, church, here's what you know. Here's what you know about brokenness. You know there is a cure. You know that there is a cure that can provide transformation and healing, and that transformation, that healing and wholeness has a name, and his name is Jesus. You know the cure for what is wrong with a broken world. His name is Jesus. And the question I got to ask you this morning is, who have you told lately about the cure? You have a cure. You have a cure for sin. You have the cure. You know the cure for sin. You know the cure for death. You know who God is and what he can do to restore a life. Who have you told lately? Think about this for a moment. If you had the cure to Alzheimer's, if you had the cure to MS, dementia, 
would you have an obligation to tell people? If you had a cure to those terminal diseases, those life-altering diseases that break people before it kills them, would you have an obligation to tell people about the cure? Oh, you're all silent because you know where I'm going with this. You know you have an obligation. I mean, how much would you have to dislike or hate people not to provide them with a cure if you had one? And yet I gotta ask, how much would you have to dislike or hate somebody to not tell them about Jesus? The great physician, the great healer, the great savior, you know stuff. Do you have an obligation to share? The king of Israel had some common sense. He knew he did not have the cure. He knew he did not have the cure. Where he failed was not in telling Naaman where the cure was. He knew the cure, but he withheld it. Christian, we have the cure, and we are called to point people in that direction. So Elisha, Here's about the king's encounter with Naaman. And he's feeling for the king, and he knows the king is scared, and he knows that he can do something about this situation. So he sends his messenger, and his messenger basically says to the king, send Naaman to Elisha, and Elisha will help. So picture this scene. I want you to imagine that one day you're at home, and you're, I don't know, maybe cooking a meal, doing the dishes. Maybe you're just puttering around in your garden, and all of a sudden, the U.S. Army is on your doorstep, tanks and all. And they're knocking on your door. Elisha has an army on his doorstep. And now look at what he does. Look at how he responds to it. He says to Naaman, Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River, then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of your leprosy. Now understand, Elijah did not deliver this message. His servant did. Elisha did not actually even go out and have the courtesy or the respect to meet Naaman at the door. He sends his servant. Now look at how Naaman responds to this directive. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would certainly come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus, the Abana, and the Farpar better than any of the rivers of Israel? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. Let me translate this for you. He sulked. He sulked. He was so unhappy because Elisha did not do what he expected him to do. Church, hear me. When your heart's filled with pride, when your heart is filled with you, and your heart is filled with your expectations, you will start writing your own prescriptions. And you will start telling God what you think God should do in your situation. You see, I don't know if you've heard about this. It's called the expectation gap. Sometimes maybe you've seen a meme where you have somebody and they bought something online and they had an expectation, but the reality was very different. We call that the expectation gap. And your happiness or your disappointment will be proportional to the gap between your expectation and reality. Elisha came with an expectation, but he ran into a reality called God. And there was a gap, and he was sulking, and he was angry. I can't tell you how often in my life I became angry with God because I had an expectation. I had a need. 
I had a problem. And I had solutions, but I wasn't powerful enough to carry out the solution. So I come to God with both the problem and the solution. I have an expectation, and I believe the reality should be that God meets my expectation. I mean, after all, I'm coming to him with the need and the solution, right? I mean, you'd think I could be a part of the process. Christian, what if when you come to God with your brokenness and your problem, what if God's ways are not your ways? What if God's thoughts are not your thoughts? What, what, what if God's will and God's way does not actually align with your will and your way? Oh, don't get me wrong. God wants you to be healed. God wants to take care of your brokenness, but not in the way you thought he would. Can you trust God with your brokenness even if he doesn't live up to your expectations? What if God is not calling you to the clean waters of Damascus, but the dirty waters of Israel? Can you trust that God does not care about the waters, but what he cares about is your heart? Do you understand that when you bring anything to God, in your brokenness or your need, God has an agenda, and that is not to only meet your need, but to take you beyond in what he wants for your life. Can you trust God that maybe God's way is not your way? God's will is not your will? Damon wants to go home to Damascus. He likes the waters back there. He likes the air back there. He, he, he thinks the waters are superior back there. Here's what you need to know. That the strategies God has used in your life over here may not be the same strategies he will use in your life over there. Now let me tell you why this is so important. Because some of us come to church with expectations. Oh, we expect the church to worship a certain way, pray a certain way, sing a certain way, and, and oh, by the way, like, like, why are you doing it this way in Israel? Because, you know, back home in Damascus, pastor, we did it a different way, and of course, the way we did it in Damascus is by far superior than to how you're doing it in Jerusalem. Do you understand that what God does in Jerusalem may not necessarily work in Damascus? And I'm saying this because I want you to understand that many of you and many of us come from other places. I come from Newfoundland. We worship differently over there. We behave differently over there. But I understand that St. John's Newfoundland, the strategies that work there do not work in Ottawa. Do you understand that there is no blueprint? There are no blueprints. We have council after council after council that says you have to consider where you are because God's strategies are determined by the people, who they are, the culture you are dealing with. And if you've ever done missionary work, you would know this. Trust me, if you were going to do mission work in an Arab country, you will go through six months to a year of sensitivity training and learning how to do strategies in a new land. Just because we did things and you did things differently in Damascus, that doesn't mean it's going to work in Jerusalem or Ottawa. And I can't tell you how many people come to church and they get angry and they get upset because we're not doing it like Damascus. I'm sorry, you're not in Damascus. You're not. And so God has a will and a way for each place and each church and each human being. Which is why your journey towards sanctification won't be my journey towards sanctification. Because the strategies the Holy Spirit is using to heal you, restore you, and transform you may not be strategies that will work for me. Do you understand this? Which is why we're not called to look at other people who will be called to look at. Jesus, because he has a plan for transforming and restoring your life, and it might look differently in your life than mine. Can you handle that? Do you understand that God personally invests in you as an individual? 
and then as a family, and then as a church, and what works for your family may not work for mine. And you need to understand that God has a will and a way. And what he's asking us to do is drop our prescriptions as to how things should be done and listen to how and what the Holy Spirit is telling us should be done. And this is why we need to talk to God. This is why we need the habit of prayer. But do you know what the most powerful aspect to prayer is? Do you know what the most powerful aspect to prayer is? It's not the prayer It's the listening. Did you follow that? The most powerful aspect to prayer is not so much the prayer as it is the listening. Because if you want God to direct your life and intervene in your life and give you wisdom and direction and discernment, then you have to be quiet long enough for him to tell you what to do. The most powerful aspect of prayer is not so much in the talking as it is in the listening. And Naaman wasn't listening because he had a script, he had a prescription, he had expectations as to how things should be done his way, and he asked, he requested, but he did not listen. Church, are you ready to listen? You see, the healing of your heart begins with the humbling of your spirit. God wants your life to be whole. God wants to bring together all the broken pieces of your life. But God can't begin to heal what you're trying to manage. You need to put down your script. You need to let go of control. You see, for most of us, when something goes wrong, you know what plan A is? Plan A is, and we know what the right thing to do is, pray and ask God to take it over. That's what we do. But the moment God is not behaving the way we think he should, the moment he tells us to jump in the dirty water, we go to plan B. You know what plan B is? Plan B is you. Plan B is your solution to the problem because you're not willing to trust God or maybe you're not listening to God when he says, no, it's not that clean water that will heal you. It's the waters of Jerusalem and the Jordan. The healing of your heart begins with the humbling of your spirit. So much so that when you give it to God, give it to God, and then you go where God tells you to go and you do what God tells you to do. So, I have one more verse. It's verse 13. So, Naaman's angry. He's jumped on his horse and he's riding away and he's headed back to Damascus. Now listen to what his soldiers say to him. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do something very difficult, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says simply, go and wash and be cured. Here's why you need godly people in your life. The reason you need godly people in your life is because they will not point you to your script, they will point you to Jesus. You see, your friends and your family, they know you. They know your script, They know your tendencies. They know how you operate. And when you have good friends and good family who love the Lord and they love you, they're not going to point you to you and your power and your ability. They're going to point you to Jesus. They're going to call you to walk into obedience. They're going to ask you to do what you know is right. I had a friend one time who was going through a divorce. He was broken. Oh, he was broken. And he cried. Could hardly make it to work some days. He was so depressed. And, and he would, basically, he just fell into this deep frustration and anger, even resentment. And he said, I'm praying, and why won't God tell me what to do? And he got angry with me when I pointed out to him that God wasn't doing what he thought God should be doing. And I said, God's not going to answer your prayer, my friend, until you learn to walk into obedience 
into what he's already told you to do. Naaman hears the godly counsel. This is inspired counsel. It's calling him into obedience. It is godly counsel. And so what does he do? He gets down off his high horse, and he strips down, and he walks into the water. Did you know that there's a water that can cure? Do you know that there's a water that can heal? Do you know that there's a water that God uses to restore? And we call it baptismal waters. You see, every single one of us, we're broken. Every single one of us, we need healing from guilt and shame and and our sin. God has provided a way to cure your sin problem. His name is Jesus Christ, and what God wants you to do is go to the water. Do you understand? Naaman gets into the water, and he's commanded to literally baptize himself seven times. He goes down once, checks, no change. Two, three, four, five, six, he checks, no change. It wasn't until he fully submerged himself, not so much in the water, but the will of God, only then was the spot removed. Only when we submit and submerge ourselves completely into the will of God and what he calls us to do, only then will true transformation take place in our life. And God calls you. He called you to waters. He called you to baptism. And on that day that Naaman got baptized, that that, that day he got cleansed, he stripped himself of everything he was. Off came the medals. Off came the armor. Off came the gold, the riches. And all that stood in that water was the man before God. And when we get baptized, we strip ourselves of our ego and our pride, and we strip ourselves of everything that we have committed ourselves to that bless and benefit us, we put us to death, and we stand there before God as we are and who we are. And we go down in that water, and we become crucified in Christ Jesus, and everything you have ever done wrong, all the guilt, all the shame, all the pain over anything and everything you've done you wish you could undo, gets undone in those waters, because it dies. And so do you. Naaman had to die to his ego. He had to die to self before he could go down because humility is the first step to your healing. You need to understand that not in your might or in your power, and God says not even in his might or his power, but in his spirit, says the Lord. And you are called to waters As a fully devoted follower of Jesus, you are called to come to the waters where you strip yourself of you and you're prepared to die to you and be raised to this new life in Jesus whereby the brokenness dies, the sin, it dies, the shame and the guilt, it dies, and you are raised to a new life in Christ Jesus. Will you come to the waters? Because as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ, I not only died the day they baptized me, but I commit myself to dying every day. I die to my ego. I die to my expectations. And I come every day and I say, God, baptize me anew in your spirit. Because this is what healing is. It is allowing the Holy Spirit to baptize you anew every day so that what is broken gets submitted. What is Hurting gets submitted. What is not working gets submitted so that the power of the Holy Spirit can come into you and cleanse you anew so that God can restore and transform your life. And what I want you to know is that when you come to the Lord for healing, you walk away with far more than you asked for. You see, Naaman, he came looking for healing, but what God wanted to give him was faith. He came looking to get his life back, but he got a new life and a new perspective in who the one true God is. I don't know if you're broken. I don't know what's not working in your life. 
I, I don't know what it is you are struggling with. I, I don't know what it is you are praying for and asking for God to transform and heal in your life, but I'm asking you to come to two places, the cross and the waters. I'm asking you today to come to the cross of Jesus Christ and recognize your brokenness and your need for a Savior. And then I'm asking you, and I'm inviting you to come to the water, because in the water we find a new life in the one who can heal all that brokenness. I'm asking you today, do you need to be healed? You got something you've been praying for that needs to be fixed? Do you have something in your life you just wish that God would wash away? Maybe there's some spot of sin, some spot of guilt. Maybe there's some spot in your marriage or your finances, your home, and it's not working, and you want God to wash it all away? Come to the cross. Come to the waters. And God can restore what was broken, and he will make it whole. Because what he makes whole is you what he wants to make whole is you. Will you come to the cross? Will you come to the waters? Will you come to be healed? Healing has a name, and his name is Jesus. <laughs>